It's not NASCAR. It's not the Monaco Grand Prix. But pigeon racing is racing with a subculture that is callous and cruel, hardly royal and genteel. So why does the Queen of England patronize pigeon racing? Next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Pigeon racing often flies under the radar, but in its latest investigation into the so-called sport, PETA has found that all eight of the Queen of England's birds have died. They were sent to take part in the South African million-dollar pigeon race, often called the Olympics of Pigeon Racing. The Queen is a major patron of all pigeon racing, and now PETA is asking that she end her support. The Queen's birds died in quarantine, even before the race began, among the 1,000 who died. In all, 4,000 birds were entered from 36 countries, with only 800 surviving the race. Hannah Schein, Senior Director of Investigations for PETA, believes the numbers only mask the cruelty and signal the urgency to end pigeon racing now. Here's my conversation with Hannah Schein on the PETA podcast. You know, you do all these um, investigations. How do you come up with the investigations that you do? You go to bed at night and think, oh, what am I going to look at undercover next time? Or how do you come up with these things? Well, PETA tries to investigate the industries that use the most animals and cause the most suffering. But we also really try to cover the breadth of animal exploitation and not hit the same topics over and over again. So we really educate people about things they haven't thought about necessarily. So it, it it's always come, you know, been brought to our attention that pigeon racing kills tremendous numbers of birds. And we started in 2009 looking into it and released our first investigation of pigeon racing in 2010. And from there, you know, we, we, did, we did the U.S. investigation first, exposed the rampant killing of birds, uh, illegal gambling extensively. And we actually ended up getting three people charged for mm. commercial gambling, felony commercial gambling in the United States, which was a, a huge coup to make a pigeon-related pun. The, the resulting court case you know, that those prosecutions were the first time that pigeon racers had been held accountable for illegal conduct in the U.S. So it was it was a pretty exciting way to, to start out in, in investigating this kind of conduct. And so then we investigated pigeon racing in the U.K. and showed the deadly cross English channel racing that was going on from people trucking birds to the continent and then having them have to fly back to the United Kingdom. And then we investigated in pigeon racing in Taiwan. It's interesting. There were some discussion boards, some pigeon forums after our first two investigations that said, oh, P PETA should really go to Taiwan and see what they're doing out there. But they would never dare. Someone will just throw them off of a ship. And we looked into it and it, it's they actually race pigeons in Taiwan off of cargo ships because it's a smallish island. And in order for all the racers to race their birds equivalent distances, they take these poor birds uh, onto a cargo ship and release them in the middle of the ocean. And so that that was a bit of a, a gauntlet thrown down. So we did investigate pigeon racing in Taiwan. And not to um, not to bore you with... Uh, no, it's not <laughs> boring. It's just that, you know, I, I just went into a little thing thinking, oh, well, you know, she's going to say, oh, I just thought about this. But you, this has been a pigeon obsession, really, in a way. Right. Yeah, it has. Well, you know, you, when you learn about pigeons, you really grow to respect and love them. And they're amazing birds. They're so smart. They're so loving. They're such amazing mates and parents. They, um, and these are exactly the, the characteristics that make them exploitable by, by pigeon racers. The, their love of home, their love of family, their navigation abilities, their intelligence are exactly what makes them able to come home even when pigeon racers haul them hundreds of miles away and release them in unknown environments. So it's really twisted. They take 
their best qualities and uh, and exploit them um, for their amusement. Really, it, it's really funny because I just seeing the coverage you've gotten and seeing uh, the investigation, seeing the video, you do come away with God. What do what must it be like to be a pigeon and to be sort of mm-hmm. be put into this thing where um, you're, you're racing at high altitudes and you come back and you can mm-hmm. barely walk into your cage. I mean, you can't really see that without feeling something for the birds. And if you feel that something for the birds, you say, why are we uh, allowing for this cruelty to occur? So uh, I right. think, I think it's very effective that, that you've done this. And before, I mean, you know, you just written, listed off this whole range of investigations on, on pigeons. Mm-hmm. It's still going on though. Uh, it must, on some level, you're gratified that you've been able to do some things that have made some right. changes. But on the other hand, it doesn't, it doesn't do away with the whole activity. It still goes on. Not yet, but we've, we've made some progress after the Taiwan investigation. We didn't have the highest of hopes of, for that culture because their animal protection laws aren't as as strong as some countries. But we found that the police did systematic raids of pigeon racing clubs after our investigation and put out news releases afterward, crediting PETA with uh, alerting them to these situations. And they busted a number of clubs. They confiscated millions of dollars and uh, also pigeon racing apparatuses, computers, and um, they ended up charging 242 different people for illegal activity involved in pigeon racing. So that was the most uh, individuals ever convicted after a PETA investigation. So we do feel like maybe that's having a bit of a chilling effect in Taiwan in terms of the gambling, uh, which is the biggest driver of pigeon racing there. And in the U.S., we did see that because the the wagering, the illegal gambling was was prosecuted in in the U.S. races that many races after that advertised no pooling, and that's their lingo for, for wagering. So we do see that that some of the races did have to change their practices, and one would think that that would influence the number of people who send birds to those races if they know they can't engage in the, the wagering that makes it so fun for some people. But but that's kind of disgusting in, in in a way too that the exploitation of the birds is acceptable because so people can gamble and the gambling is the thing the gambling is the thrill and the right. pigeons just sort of get in the way they just go well we're gonna we're gonna exploit them we're gonna harm them we might as well wager on you know which <laughs> which pigeon is is uh, you know Dar- Darwinian enough to survive and get back home after we force them to go through all the different, you know, you know, right. pathways. It's kind of sick. Yeah. Yeah. And they treat it like a raffle or a lottery where, you know, you have to breed so many pigeons to just get that one winning ticket who will, who will win a race or win you lots of money or, and become a lucrative breeder for you. So you can sell their babies um, one after another. So, so yeah, that, that all led up to this South Africa investigation because the South African million dollar pigeon race is one that we'd kept hearing about as like the most lucrative, the most prestigious one loft pigeon race in the world, which is actually, they call it the Olympic games of pigeon racing. They have a a wide number of countries who send birds to this race. Uh, The last one in uh, February was 36 countries had, had birds at this race. And so we wanted to show what what was going on? What how are birds being traded at this at this competition? And so it's it's a real subculture you've really dived into here. I mean, starting from 2010 to to now, and you're probably practically an expert at this, uh, given <laughs> given all the investigations on pigeons. But you know, a lot of people who are listening to this would say. Oh, just get to the darn investigation, Emil. But, 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 but before we do, there there must be a large number of people who say, you know, they're they're interested in in what's happened or what happens to the animals. But I think you 
need to describe pigeon racing a little bit because it's it's not like NASCAR. It's not like people know mm -hmm. you go around in an oval uh, or you know some other kind of racing um, like the, what they do with horses, which is you know pretty pretty abominable too. You know, considering how they're treated. But pigeon racing, I mean, it's got to stop people in their tracks at first to say, yeah, pigeons, like the ones we see at the park. How, how does this thing work, pigeon racing? Right. So people have bred pigeons for thousands of years to, um, to come back to their homes. So these are homing pigeons. They're a little bit different than some other uh, domestic pigeons that have been bred to look fancy or... Um, tumble in the, in the air. There's all different kinds of pigeons, but so homing pigeons, people use them to historically to send messages back and forth or to, um, uh, yeah, or, or just purely for sport. So right now what people do for pigeon racing, there's two kinds. There's racing where you, uh, you take your birds to a central location they're trucked away and then they, they're all raced back to your different homes and the birds have a chip uh, on a band around their leg. And that, that chip, when it passes a sensor as they're entering the building that you've built for them, the, the loft, uh, it, it records in a clock and then the racers bring their clocks to their club and the results are tabulated. And then there's something else called one loft racing. Now that's, the bigger money. Um, that's where participants from a wider area, sometimes uh, international, will send their birds to one destination. Often it's a, it's someplace where people would want to go on vacation so that um, people will come, come in person to actually see the final race and make their wagers in person. And so you find these in uh, across the U.S. and across the world in South Africa and Thailand um, that the Canary Islands have all kinds of one loft races. And that's where the birds are sent as babies just after they're weaned, they leave the nest and they're shipped off so that they home to this, this new loft. They, they then consider that their home and they're all uh, trained on progressively longer training tosses and preliminary races. And then it culminates in the main race. So all the birds are trucked to a, a single location and then they fly back to that one loft. And that's why it's called the one loft race. So it's about all about getting home. There's a kind of a, it's all about getting home at the highest rate of speed. And for these one loft races, because especially in the South Africa race, they train them almost every day. So um, it's very taxing on the birds. And in this um, situation, they're, they're not, segregating birds who maybe don't arrive back the same day of the training or the race. They're just, the birds come in. And then if there's another race two hours later, they all get sent out for that, for that training or that race. So they consider this, you know, a test of, of the quality of the birds. And there's not really a lot of sentiment or sympathy for birds who don't make the grade. It's the idea is to to winnow them down so that only a few people win the big prizes. And that wouldn't happen if you, if you were less um, hard <laughs> on yeah. the birds, unfortunately. So it's a, it's a major test of endurance. Many birds die in the process. Yeah. In the South Africa race, not only is it a test of endurance, but many, many thousands of birds historically have died at that race before even starting training. Um, when you have birds coming in from many different countries, they they keep them for about a month in a, in a quarantine situation where they're, they're not leaving the loft. And in this current edition of the race, out of over 5,000 birds who were entered, uh, about 1,200, the race manager told us, died just in quarantine alone, including all eight of the birds sent by the Queen of England. And that really is the beginning of the investigation it was in England and you're, you're linking up the queen to uh, this, this sport. Is this a Royal sport? If the queen's involved, the queen of England. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she's a patron of many UK pigeon racing organizations and she maintains a Royal loft in Sandringham, which is an estate that she owns. And she has about 200 pigeons there. She, they, they breed them constantly and they send them to 
both races in the UK, uh, races that fly from back to, from France to the UK, and this race in South Africa. And they're also entered in the another long distance marathon race, which is very deadly, called the the Barcelona International Race. And that one is, I think, 750 miles back to, to the loft after crossing Spain, France, and the English Channel. So, uh, yes, she's unfortunately supporting these, these deadly races. And um, we've asked her to please stop doing that. And to turn her pigeon loft, instead of a breeding mill like most pigeon racers lofts, just to turn it into a sanctuary, to turn it into some kind of haven for injured or found um, or unwanted racing pigeons. Now, before PETA's investigation, has anyone ever gone to the queen and asked her to stop participating in this blood sport? I mean, has anyone ever, you know, gone up to her and said look at what this sport is about. You should stop it. I don't think so. There's this myth that pigeon racing is a quaint, harmless pastime when in fact it's a, it's a, these competitions are massacres masquerading as sport. They're, they're blood sports and it's, you know, they paint this picture of the, you know, the, how they cherish the birds and how um, the birds come home because the love of the loft but really, they know that they're breeding, in the Queen's case, about 80 birds a year um, and, and sending them out to races, knowing very well that most of them will not come back. So it's, it's disingenuous to claim that you love birds and yet put them into that peril. It's kind of like a suicide mission, huh? Absolutely, but it's a numbers game. So they know that they have to breed 100 young birds a year in order to have 30 of them by the next year and then a few left after that to keep as future breeders. It's, if, if pigeon racers got back all 100 birds every year, can you imagine how large their lofts would have to be to accommodate that? So it's a way of winnowing the herd in, in a way? Um... Absolutely. And over and over again, our investigators are told that if you want to be a top pigeon fancier, which is what they call themselves, that you have to be ruthless in selecting only the best birds, only the best bloodlines, only the most success successful racers. And if you don't, you're just going to be breeding with, you know, breeding rubbish as they call it. Um, and then you'll never be a top pigeon racer. So over and over again, when we've asked pigeon racers, the secret to their success, they say it's, by selecting the best birds or um, they even use the word calling, which they sometimes claim is just um, another synonym for selecting, but really what it means is killing. So if you don't keep um, many birds, then you're, you're essentially either losing them in races, which in which they die or you're, you're killing them. And when you peel back the curtain, uh, when you pull that back and you get them to really admit what they do, most of them say that they break their necks. Uh, we had one pigeon racer tell us uh, in the U.S. that he squeezes their breasts so they can't breathe. We've had people say they drown them. Um, occasionally, people will say that they're too soft to kill them themselves, so they'll give them to a live market. But generally, the main way that pigeon racers get rid of birds that they don't find fit enough or lucrative enough is they break their necks. You have a video in the investigation and people can see it at uh, PETA.org uh, where they have these bags. It's and the guy talks about it very matter of factly. Uh, I suppose you had an undercover camera as the guy's describing it because he, he's very nonchalant about actually killing a bird, right? you know, before the camera. Yeah, we did have undercover cameras, but that person actually let us stick our camcorders right in that feed bag that he was using to keep the blood off his clothes and property. So um, that was one case where, uh, you know, covert cameras weren't even the, the sole <laughs> means of recording, shockingly. 
And, and so we, we were able to show the standard practice of how, how birds are, are pretty callously killed for pigeon racing. So when you did the undercover story in, in England um, Mm -hmm. and you got the, the queen's trainer and um, you showed how she has eight birds. She's got some, I guess some really prized breeding pigeons that she houses there. Is that it? Sure. Well, you know, part of the, the, you know, the prestige of being the queen is that even if your birds aren't the best racing birds, people still want them. They still want the novelty of having a bird that has the queen's name on his leg or her leg. So we attended this auction, which is the biggest pigeon show of the year in England and, and showed that the two birds being sold by the queen's loft um, who happened to be a male and a female were bought by a single person who intended to breed them as a, as a novelty and have them um, in his loft. And he, he said, you know, they'll die here. They'll never leave here because as you know, if a pigeon is homed to a certain loft and you bring them somewhere else, you sell them to another flyer, that flyer can't let them out or else they'll just go back to their home. So they're called prisoners, these birds, and then they're just used for breeding. And depending on the breeder, they might just serially breed them over and over and over. In fact, these birds were purchased in late January. By the end of March, they'd already produced four babies for this guy. So were they good racers? Or- I think they were just actually young birds who'd probably never even raced. They were just uh, bred by the loft and, and sold at this auction. And it's, it's more that this flyer wanted the novelty of having Queens birds in his collection. So if you have a Queens bird, that's a, that's a, that's considered status. They're not necessarily sure. good, good racers. And what did the investigation find in terms of the Queens, the, the Queens birds? Um, I know that we, you ultimately yeah, get to I the mean, South Africa race, but what did you find right. about, you know, what she, what happens to her birds and the people who care for them or don't care for them really? Right. So she had sent eight birds to the South Africa race this year and when we say for the 2020 race, they were shipped in, in 2019, but they did not, I think two died each week of the four week quarantine. And so all eight were dead, according to Paul Smith, who is the, um, the UK coordinator who transports all the birds from, from the UK to the South Africa race. And he jokes about it again, so callously joking that he called the queen to let her know that all her birds are gone. And he, he said, well, there's my knighthood gone. Um, and he, he made that joke several times actually about his knighthood. Not um, <laughs> would, would the, would the queen even knight him if he were successful or is that, that is a kind of a joke, I guess. Just, just a joke. Just saying that, you know, he, um, he had bad news to deliver to her and, but, but it's not new. It's not in the last six years, we analyzed the records for this race and of the 42 birds she sent over those six years, only five survived till the end of the race. So it's, it's not unusual for her to lose birds at this competition. So the callousness of, of this all and considering the gentility of the queen and how England and UK is generally more animal rightsy than you would expect. I mm-hmm. mean, it's got to be shocking that when you broke this investigation in, in England, uh, there was some hue and cry on people that, that someone, this PETA is urging the queen to, to end pigeon race cruelty. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was big news in, in England. It was, there was a good wave of press. It was broken by the times covered by the express and on the front page of the daily star. So it, it, it did make a splash and all the different classes, <laughs> all the, I mean, you went the tabloids to the high end. It was right. right. It made the, the, yeah, the spectrum of, of UK broad, uh, you know, journalism. And now just this week, uh, there's a new wave of press coming out of South Africa where it just made it on the, um, the investigative news magazine Newsweek and, yeah, so the the press is now picking up 
in South Africa, and we hope that continues. But yeah, you know, you would think that the queen would want to avoid unsavory associations, but that's just what we keep finding whenever we investigate pigeon racing is the seedy underbelly, the the deeply unsavory, you know, behind the scenes goings on at these races. And at the South Africa race, I mean, it's it's a litany of illegality that we found. It, it's just miraculous. Like we have um, submitted complaints. We have a crackerjack lawyer who wrote these amazing complaints about the illegalities. Um, one complaint was about invasive species and violations of the environmental laws in South Africa because pigeons are considered an, uh a non-native species there. They're considered invasive. And this racing organization does not appear to have any permits for importing pigeons and keeping them in South Africa. So uh, he drafted this really detailed complaint about that. He also submitted a complaint about the rampant illegal gambling that we found there. And um, a third complaint went over all the financial shenanigans that our investigator was was told about quite openly by some of these pigeon racers. And some of the things they were admitting to was how to use pigeon racing for tax evasion, money laundering, um, currency exchange control, where you know South Africa has rules for how much money you can move out of the country. So they were explaining that the pigeon trade is quote, better than diamonds for being able to move money between countries without government oversight. So was this organized crime or just a a bunch of uh, fanciers or Mm -hmm. enthusiasts who uh, were rich and needed some money to launder and they had stumbled into this great unregulated thing called pigeon racing? Yeah, absolutely. It's just a really ripe... Um, unregulated industry that's that's apparently an easy avenue for people with money to be able to move it back and forth by uh, selling birds, trading birds, claiming that the bird died, and that you know they they actually gave our investigators such detailed examples that when I read the legal complaint, I I was I was blown away by how compelling it was. And I, I really think the authorities are going to be, uh, they're going to really have a lot to dig their teeth into. Now you're talking about South Africa, but no doubt there must yes. be some kind of mirror thing going on in, in the UK. Are they looking into the same kind of thing, but, or does it get kind of whitewashed in a way because of the queen? The queen's Well, in the UK, we found that uh, they actually do allow gambling on pigeon racing. They're, UK is very liberal about gambling on most things. And you can walk into um, just street storefronts yeah. and gamble on pretty much anything from sports to politics. Right. Anything. Right. Exactly. Right. You know, <laughs> anything. What color um, Trump's hair is this week. Hair. Yeah, exactly. So that that wasn't uh, really gonna, going to be a fruitful avenue for for us in the UK. But we, you know, we certainly appeal to... Um, to the queen and, and we've appealed to uh, to government agencies there about the, the issue of birds traveling over country lines in terms of spreading disease. Like, I mean, pigeons are wonderful, but they, they carry, they can carry disease. You know, they can, um, they can become infected with bird flu, Newcastle disease, and they have, uh, you know, diseases that are zoonotic that are, that can actually affect people's health regardless of, um, whether they ha- are symptomatic or not. And and the other diseases that I just mentioned, like Newcastle and, and bird flu, have billion dollar implications for the the poultry industries, the you know, the birds who are in factory farming settings. Um, so it it's it's something that we have definitely submitted complaints to UK officials about. And you know, we'll use any kind of legal leverage we can to try to get these kind of races stopped because they're bad for pigeons and they're bad for people. Well, it sounds like it's such an unregulated thing. I mean, uh, on the one hand, you know, you're saying uh, 
in South Africa, you know, it's sort of the wild west, but you know, gambling is legal in the UK, but yeah. And, but gambling aside, just in terms of the cruelty, there should be something in uh, for uh, to to protect the welfare of the animals. And is there anything uh, that is strong enough to to go to these fanciers, these pigeon fanciers, and say, "Hey, uh, let's keep in mind standards of animal cruelty or animal welfare." I wish it were illegal on those grounds, but officials that we've approached about cruelty to animals charges. They need to see dead bodies, essentially. They need to see that animals have been harmed. And when you have a typical pigeon race where you send out a 1,000 birds and 200 come home, where's the proof of suffering and death? Very often, you don't know what happened to those birds. You just know that they are most likely dead. Domesticated you know, p- pigeons, they're given food. They're given water. They don't get taught the skills from their families, how to find food and water in the wild. So most pigeon races are intended to become, uh, to be completed in one day without the birds staying out overnight, which becomes much more dangerous for them trying to find food and water, trying to avoid predators. And to us sending hundreds or thousands of pigeons out hundreds of miles from their home and abandoning them It's like taking that many dogs or chickens or any other animal away from their homes and and, uh, abandoning them. It should be considered cruelty. But because pigeons have this homing ability and there's this tradition of using them for sport, they somehow get a free pass. And yet when you say a thousand get let out, 200 come back, those 800 that uh, are presumed dead, I mean, they're, they're not off somewhere flying to some Southern, uh, uh, you know, landscape to enjoy their, their life in the sun. They, they're usually don't, like you said, they don't uh, know how to, you know, fend for themselves, get food and water. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even those that survive the race are like practically gasping to get back into the loft because they're, they're dehydrated. They don't have water. I mean, you have a, a tremendous bit of footage it shows, how, uh, how some birds are at, you know, after they finish the race. So, I mean, isn't that proof though, if 800 don't come back, that this is not sport, that this is not, uh, something that is pro animal in any way. Absolutely. It's not pro animal. And, um, as you saw in the video where the, some of the birds land and they can't even walk, they, they just face plant on the concrete um, the, you know, these birds that were released for the South Africa race, the final race, they had to fly 373 miles. It was the longest they'd ever flown. It was extremely hot. It was in the mid nineties where they were flying in, in Fahrenheit. Um, they were at a high altitude and in, I mean, in terms of the ground level, it was, I think it was 1600 meters, which is about a mile high. So it's like flying in for, for, you know, if you were suddenly, you know, transported to Denver and had to exercise and uh, they're flying over desert and the birds were let out, I think, 6 a.m. from the truck and only three made it back by nightfall. And the rest of them had to somehow find their way back. And out of 1500 plus birds who were sent out for that final race, there were only 704 who made it back. Within seven weeks, these stats are from seven weeks after the race when they finally stopped counting. See, for, for, for normal people, when they hear that, they've got to be somewhat appalled. But to the pigeon fancier and to that whole subcult, it's like, oh, well, that's just the way it is. That's got to be shocking. Yeah. And they tout, you know, I had a bird who was 33rd in the race or, or by my babies because their father was 11th in the race. You know, they, they tout that as the harder the race, the more interesting it is for them when they're selling the, um, the offspring of those, those successful birds. And how much, if you wanted to buy a bird, uh, like a Queens bird or a successful bird, 
Uh, could they, do the breeders get thousands or is it? They can. Yeah. The winner of the 2020 race sold for, I think, $118,000 this year. So that's a pretty big payoff. Not, not counting the fact that they, um, they want the winner won 150,000 in prize money, plus any winnings that if the racer gambled on their bird and, and, you know, some people make over $300,000 from a race like that. So this is eye opening to people who are for animal rights, animal welfare. They 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 feel you know people who are empathetic toward animals. What can be done? I mean, you've made an appeal with your investigation to to the Queen of England to end pigeon race cruelty, but what is what does the Queen say? Right now, they're not saying anything. They just say that they comply with all rules and regulations in the UK. But we are asking people who, who feel that this should stop to sign our petition um, at, at PETA.org. Actually, um, we have the main petition on the, the UK PETA site. And we also have action alerts still posted about Taiwan pigeon racing, if people want to take action on that as well, asking that... Taiwan stop its ocean racing, which is exceptionally cruel. And um, it's, it's hard. It's one of those things where there's, it's not easy to boycott as a consumer, this kind of industry, because it's not dependent on the public support. It just goes but, on underneath uh, our noses, really. I mean, it's, it's this subculture and uh, I, 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 I know they probably can just say, well, if they got rid of the worst things, um, it's still just a bunch of guys with birds, right? Doing their thing. Well, do women do this? Are there women pigeon racers, pigeon fanciers? There there are. It's definitely more men than women, but there are there are some women who are the primary uh flyers in their family who enter birds under their name, but it's it's very, very much uh, more dominated by by males and it does cross all socioeconomic strata and it's it's in the u.s at least it can be actually larger among more recent immigrants than than not so you get a, um, a wide cross section of national origins involved in the sport um, but what, so did, it's, what do they get yeah. out of it though what, what do the people who are pigeon racers when they know what's happening to their animals I mean, they can't love the animals if they know that the animals can die or the animals are subjected to these uh, really extreme conditions that could mean death. What do they get out of it, the the pigeon fanciers? It's hard to say. Some people do like keeping pigeons and they have, I think in their own heads, they think they love pigeons. There must be some cognitive dissonance there because they are putting the pigeons in harm's way. And they know they're not getting all their pigeons home and they, they rely on that or else they wouldn't be able to breed so many and, and um, they would have nowhere to put them. But there are, on the other end of the spectrum, there are people who don't claim to even love pigeons who are also very much involved in bird hunting. And they keep pigeons uh, as a way of also having birds to train their hunting dogs with. So I've seen plenty of that kind of discussion on, on websites. And, um, you know, some people do it for bragging rights. Some people do it just because they grew up doing it and, and they have fond family associations with pigeon racing. And but I, other people do it for, for money, for profit. And I suppose the Queen's uh, endorsement of it is a big thing. If she were to say tomorrow, Let's end pigeon racing. I'm sorry um, for what I've done to my my family and also to the pigeons. And I'm going to get rid of pigeon racing. Would it, or, or I'm going to pull out. I'm going to be the queen. I'm going to pull out of pigeon racing. Would it have an impact? I would think it would have an impact, at least in the UK. And maybe open people's eyes to the fact that it it is such a... It is such a slaughter. And, you know, some people excuse it by saying, well, 
the birds are eaten by hawks or it's a kind of a natural selection kind of thing. But you're breeding the pigeons and putting them out there to be killed. It's not natural for for your birds to be killed by, by hawks if they wouldn't exist or not for your breeding mill. So. It's, it's almost as if, uh, just like um, the rats in a, a laboratory, the rats and the mice in the laboratory, and people say, oh, we don't care about lab, you know lab rats or lab mice, or and they they don't consider those as significant lives. Um, when you get to the numbers in in pigeon racing, is it that same thing too? That well, we just don't consider these lives worthy enough. The pigeons. Probably, I mean, people see um, what they what pigeon racers call common pigeons. Pigeons that you you know you see um, on buildings and in parks, and probably think, what's the difference? There's plenty of pigeons out there. It's not like they're endangered. I've heard those exact sentiments before. But we wouldn't do this to other animals. We wouldn't do this to puppies. We wouldn't do this to horses. So, I think if people got to know pigeons better and their really wonderful qualities. Um, they would be more sympathetic and, and more ashamed of, of what is done to pigeons. Well, Hannah Shine, I have to say that uh, I I didn't realize this wasn't your first rodeo in terms of the <laughs> pigeons and that you went back and had this litany of investigation going back, going back to 2010. Here we are 10 <laughs> years later and the sport is still thriving but I think if people see this investigation and if maybe you get the queen uh, to see the cruelty, I think you're making some real headway and I congratulate you on this investigation. Thanks, Emil. And I hope that people see the investigation at PETA.org. Thank you for enlightening us on pigeons. I, I grew up, I, I mean, I used to think pigeons were only in San Francisco where I grew up and there were like a ton of pigeons mm-hmm all over the city, but they're everywhere, right? They're they're like a common bird, right? I mean. They are. They're a bird that everyone could probably look out their window and admire. Um, But I do think if people took a little time to read up on pigeons, they would appreciate them even more. What's the one thing, if you could tell the queen about the, the special quality or the special nature of pigeons that makes this whole thing about the cruelty to pigeons so, you know, just uh, unimaginable mm-hmm. because these are living, breathing beings. What would you tell her? There's so many standout qualities of pigeons, but because the royal family is known for family dedication, I would emphasize the pigeons' dedication to family. They're excellent parents. Both of the pigeons, the father and the mother, make milk in their crops for each of their two babies. So they have two babies at a time. They each take turns sitting on the nest each day. So they're exemplary parents. Uh, They're dedicated to each other. If they had their choice, they'd mate for life. And I think that that kind of family dedication would resonate with someone who's, um, who's kind of known for her own dedication to family, the queen. Hannah Shine, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your investigations that you do. And they're all done. I, I got to think they're kind of dangerous too, with the, the kind of underbelly that's associated with, with pigeon racing. Um, so I, I appreciate your, uh, your courage and your willingness to, to get out there and to, Thank you. This one, my boots were not on the ground in South Africa. So my shout out to the person who, who did the legwork there. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it can be a scary thing. Well, uh, it's, it's an eye opening investigation and I hope people understand, uh, what's, uh, going on right under our noses, the, the cruelty to pigeons in this thing they call pigeon racing. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Emil. <laughs> Hannah Shine, Senior Director of Investigations for PETA, 
See the latest investigation of PETA involving the Queen of England and the South African Million Dollar Pigeon Race at PETA.org. And that's our program. You can contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok, that's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K, or on ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund blog, that's ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Oh, and one more way to get in touch with me. See more of what I do at amok.com. And thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on Apple Podcasts where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about, or just check it out wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty free world on the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo. Thank you.